a rocking Canadian in the house. We've got a full gift bag of giveaways for you. Stay tuned. It is time for you to be at the place. What place is it? Pensado's place. Yay. Dave Pensado, is there another day? What does he have to say my last name? Sometimes you don't hear it. Hey, guys, glad to have you back. We just had a little false start. I hope some of you saw it. It was kind of good. Uh, Herb's intro was actually a little better the first time around. It was all right that time. But <laughs> so he ain't laughing, Drew. What do I do? What do I do? And we got my, my friend Greg Wells with us today, uh, just a gifted, gifted human being. You're going to be amazed when, you, when we talk to Greg. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. And... Um, it's been a fun week, right, Herb? It has been. Uh, very busy. You and Drew have been pounding them out, and more to come. I think... Uh, well, let's clarify that. We've been making a lot of records. <laughs> well... <laughs> you Canadians might have a different meaning for that, but... Well, remember, uh, if, if, and by the way, they can do this. If you go a couple shows back, you're the one who referenced being into small knobs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not knobs. sure. I'm not sure what you're offended at. <laughs> so until I have no comeback out, for that. I have no comeback. <laughs> you guys have been mixing and working. I think a lot. it's time to make you guys choose sides. But if you like Herb's <laughs> jokes better than mine, <laughs> five five five, one two one two. Or what was the number game gave out? Um, call that number and let them know that you like my jokes better than Herb's. You're, you're taking valuable time away from our guests. So <laughs> let me get some business done. He laughed. My I, guests always, laughed. Listen, Greg thinks we're crazy. So, but that means he's a good Canadian. So it, it, it's very cool. Hey, here's the good news, guys. Um, obviously, where you get in touch with us uh, is important to us, and we try to respond. There's the page. It's up right now. Facebook is the spot. You obviously can Twitter us at, uh, at Pensado's Place. Catch the show on YouTube, and for those who are catching the show and would like to catch the show live, we're on Thursdays at noon Pacific time. Uh, if not, you can catch us there. Uh, make sure at YouTube you subscribe and like us. That uh, really helps us out, and uh, your support is not only recognized, it's really valuable. Um, let's give a shout out to our guys in Vintage King. Hey, Vintage King, Vintage King applause. Ooh, yeah. Yay. So we got Alex in the chat room. Alex's page is up there right now. Um, we got some good stuff that we're going to give away. So I would say that what you want to do is come back right after the ITL. Make sure you're there. We're going to give something pretty special away. Stay tuned for that. Are you giving Drew away? <laughs> it's more special. Oh, wow. That's hard to do because Drew's pretty special. Drew's and speaking special. of Drew, you know, we call him the the CJ for chat jockey, not the DJ, and he's, he's got a new little segment. So, Drew, are you ready? I is, I <laughs> so is. So, let's introduce Drew Adams. Drew. Hey, hey. What Drew. am I doing? Hit him with your point, man. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, Does yeah, that work? Gotta, we have to work out that timing. We're, I, we're, yeah. I saw that, I Sorry, saw that point on TV recently. That's gonna what, be. what is that, Drew? I don't know. I just made it up. Uh, actually, I stole it from Ric Flair. Oh, I remember it. It's Usain Bolt. That's the Usain Bolt point. That means, that <laughs> means does, is Drew going to get disqualified? <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Man, that was horrible. Anyways, uh, back to the good stuff. We got a really cool ITL, correct? I, I, wasn't the ITL a session you guys were working on? It's okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Then, then they shouldn't work. No, that's good. I break, down, I break down how I treated one of uh, Snoop's vocals. Why don't we get to it? Let's do it. You ready, you ready, ready Will? Let's do it. Hey guys, welcome to another ITL Into the Lair. Uh, had a good week. Um, it was an interesting week. And um, um, I've gotten so many questions recently that uh, a lot of them we've covered bits and pieces. And so, what I'm going to try to do today is organize a lot of these questions. Uh, into one concentrated ITL. Will's going to um, edit it down for us and make sure I don't get too boring today. And then we might continue this a little bit next week, so we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. But I'm, I'm going to take you through, let's just call it the process of, uh, of starting a mix and getting into a mix. Um, usually what happens is someone will reach out to me and uh, I like to hear an MP3. I, I don't turn mixes down necessarily from an MP3, but I just kind of like to um, know what I'm getting into. You know, is it going to be? Am I going to have to clear out a day, two days, whatever? 
Is, is it finished? Is there a possibility that they might not finish on time? Anyway, lots of things. And then um, um, I always make notes on my first impressions of the MP3 or when I first hear the rough, uh, because I think that's, that's my most important contribution to the mix is kind of understanding what's great and what can be improved. And then uh, I'll call the producer or the artist or the label and try to get a feel for you know, the thought process of the producer and, and make sure that, that I'm part of him, um, of, of that entity. I'm part of that person's vision for what the song should be and, and, and then complete my job, which is to finish the, that element of the, of the production, which is the mixed part of the production. Um, Oh my goodness, it's Beyonce. Hold on. Uh, hey, B, can't work now on ITL. So I want you to, um, um, you know, pay attention and, and hopefully this will answer a lot of the questions I've been getting. So after I, um, after I talk to that person, then, then, you know, we get the session and you, you've seen how Drew sets it up for me. And uh, so the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll, play, the, I'll play the rough mix. Here's, here's a little piece of the rough mix. Um, this group, by the way, is called uh, FYI for Your Instincts. It's, it's a new group. I, I think they're incredible. Uh, they've got Addis uh, uh, rapping, uh, Linus, really, really cool uh, rapper. And then uh, I think an up and coming great rapper, uh, Vipers on, in the group. So you'll be hearing this soon. And um, here, here was the rough they sent. Pretty doggone good rough mix which always intimidates me a little bit because, you know, you want to you want to impress people, you know. So, um, you know, I listened to that and I, I really liked everything I heard. I, I, I felt like maybe I could, uh, you know, hip up the drums a little bit, make the vocals punch out a little more. Uh, you know, the, just just uh, kind of standard things. This 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 mix didn't require any repair work. It, it was recorded really well, uh, tracked really well. And, and so so um, the interesting thing, interesting thing about this particular song is it has Sean Kingston on it and it also has Snoop on it. So immediately I wanted to hear what Snoop sounded like. So I started actually with Snoop. When, when I first heard Snoop, I thought, I thought, man, that's, that sounds really good. You know, Snoop is so so distinctive. He's he's just got that that draw. I guess you can call it that that we all love. So um, actually, I think I could be wrong, but I think Snoop recorded this vocal himself so um, it wasn't exactly what I would call ready to go on a record but it was pretty doggone close so um, I, I ended up going with channel strip I thought it sounded a little better so you can see I'm, I'm adding a little 10k a little 8k and then the snoop the snoop frequency this makes snoop sound like snoop right here in this six seven hundred range on and on you can you guys can look at that so let me show you what that added here's Here's with here's without it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to get. Okay, now here's here's um here's with it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. So, uh, you know, I haven't heard that right now. I might add um, I might add a little bit more higher. Let's see if that makes. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Lay it kind of kind of gives them a little more bottom, doesn't it? Well, now I felt there was a little bit of a of a um, mid range thing going on that I I, did, I won't say bad or wrong. It's just I don't know, just kind of caught my ear but there were times when Sno when Snoop got kind of breathy and low where I, I liked it so I, I pulled up our old buddy C1SC 
Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to. Let me show you the frequency that I that I thought was kind of. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. So that's the frequency that I'm using the the compressor to control. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to. And this is without it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it. Okay. So that's what we added. Then this this is a, a compressor I kind of like on 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 wraps. Um, it's it's um, obviously it's a Waves compressor R box. Okay, here's without it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies. Okay, so now this is with it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got. To now. Um, I've got I've got the gain a little low, but you know I'm not gonna change. Yeah, I can change that. Just kind of give us a good A B. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Okay, so now the gain's even, and then it really didn't need much DSing. Uh, and I, I, if you remember last week, I, I didn't want to go nuts, so. I just took a little bit off. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. More, you know what? I don't even like that. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got. Glad I listened to it because that's just way too much. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I yeah, that's better, isn't it? Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. You guys just saved me a recall, thanks. That was way too much. Okay, so now this is everything. I, I'm kind of proud of this. I, I came up with this effect and I, I really like it. I think it's really good for raps. I'll show it to you in a second. This is uh, without it. Well, you know, you, you've been hearing it without it. Let's, let, me, let me go ahead and add it on. Let's see. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give. Huh? I bet you're wondering what I did, huh, Will? Okay, check this out. What I did is I took a, um, I took Waves Doubler and I added a, a, a little bit of tuning and detuning, and then uh, a not sizable chunk of delay, not quite a slap, but a pretty good delay, and then uh, of course pan that, and then I, I'm I'm feeding that into an equalizer, which I'm not actually doing much of, and then running that through our old buddy. Um, um, S1 imager, and uh, just adding a little, little lower mids. Upper, I'm actually I'm adding some high end, rolling off a little mud. But I, I think that's a great effect. And, and I'm, now I'm sending it. I'm sending it, a piece of this effect to uh, a hall on the Ricasti, and I'm also sending a piece of it to this um, to this lexicon. All right, so I think that uh, I think that takes care of Snoop. So once I got Snoop going, now it gave me a reference for some of the other rappers, uh, and I did I did similar things. I'll just uh, I'll just show you a little piece of Addis's rap. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah, I love your smile. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah, I love your smile. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah, I love your smile. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah, I love your smile. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah, I love your smile. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah, I love your smile. La, yeah, buonasera, senorita, yeah. Okay, continuing on, I I just showed you some things, and then and then our votes. We've already seen that. Yeah, yeah. So after that, um, I started on uh, checking out the, the track. So I put everything up, and you know I've got uh, I've got some instruments and and some drums, 
everything's pretty basic, you know, nothing, nothing earth shattering. Uh, it was all really well recorded. I, uh, um, I really like what we did on the drums. This is what we were given. Now, uh, I added a sample to that. And then, uh, then here's the parallel chain we talked about. Here, I'm sending this to the compressor. I, I always put that on pre. Here's my parallel uh, track. Basic little compressor. Basic little low end. There's nothing special about using the Pultec for this. Uh, in the digital world, uh, anything will work. Same thing with the compressor. Uh, I had um, I had a little faster attack time, and Drew came in and, and told me, "Hey, man, check this." He, so he slowed slowed the attack down, and I, I love what, I love what happened. So let me show you that without it with it. This is just the parallel track. That's what we're adding. All right, guys. So um, that kind of takes you, hopefully that answers a lot of your questions that I've been getting recently about getting started, thought process, all that. Um, as usual, I used, you know, I sent, I sent the drums to their own aux and then I, I uh, put a compressor on that, sent the vocals to their own aux. And the only thing different about the vocal aux this time is I just touched it with a little bit of um, UAD 1081 top end on that. And uh, then fit all four of those auxes, uh, vocal, drums, music, and effects um, to, my, to my stereo aux, stereo bus. And then I put a little bit of L2 on the, on the drums. I'm not knocking off ever more than about a dB. And on L2, I try to, excuse me, I try to keep it about dB, dB and a half, unless I'm doing like a Euro dance thing or something, or you know, like if I'm working with Alex the Kid or somebody, somebody that's really using L2. Of course, it, it's different than than they kind of set the guideline about what we do with L2. All right, hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon. Back to you, Dave. All right, I I want to thank um, um, FYI, follow your instincts, Addis and uh, Linus and Viper and, and the crew for letting us use that. Herbert? Yes? <laughs> I just want to see Man, I, 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 I wish little H was in here because we could uh, get him to do a drum roll for us. Isn't it? This is like a, a, a milestone in Pensafa's place. Is it? Tell us about it. Well, we have uh, a very cool piece of gear here that uh, we're going to give away. Um, we want to thank Vintage King um, and Shadow Hills. Uh, and of course, us at Pensado's Place. Thank you, Dave. So our little partnership is allowing to us to give you guys some real value. This is a serious piece of gear that actually the pros on either side of me both use. Yeah, when we interview Greg, we're going to talk to him about it. Absolutely. So you can see what it is there. It's the Shadow Hills Mono Optograph, and that is a serious piece of gear. Um, we're going to give it away September 29th. So you can enter on Facebook. Uh, you can enter <laughs> <laughs> promo gem. Dave's making me laugh. I'm sorry. Uh, so um, we're going to show you how to enter. Make sure you get in there. Um, this is, um, uh, as I said, this show is a gift bag. We've got either more stuff at the end of the show. But there's, there it is up on the screen. Look at um, Ryan. Ryan's graphic on yeah. it. That's cool. Good job, Ryan. That's <laughs> cool. You, you can see how to enter. Uh, and... Um, Take a shot at getting this. A lot of you wanted to get the Pro Tools knives thing. Couldn't? Now we do. Look at this. So, again, thanks to Vintage King. Uh, thanks to uh, Shadow Hills. And uh, we're going to keep rocking. So, uh, our friend Greg actually even uses this. You want to? Yeah, let's, let's just jump right in. I've been waiting all, all day to talk to Greg. Greg, good to see you, my friend. You too. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure you guys know Greg. I'm a, I had to write this down because Greg's done so much stuff, and, I, and I'm a fan of all of it. But apologize he did the good version and mm -hmm. he did the other version he mm -hmm. did both versions he did uh, uh the timbaland version the ryan tedder version 
And then he's done some records that I just love. Uh, the Mika record, he's done several of those. The one, I keep calling it the one with cartoon in the title. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to him about that. And then uh, Veronica's um, uh, little, little, little album that came out recently called Adele 21. He yeah. worked on that. Uh, Katy Perry. On and on and on. Ru Rufus Wainwright, he mm -hmm. worked on that record. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, man, just so much other stuff. But Greg, man, thanks for doing this. I, I know you're busy. I know you're in the middle of a major record and uh, uh, you guys will be hearing a real cool record for him real soon. And uh, I really appreciate you, you coming down hanging out with us, my, my friend. My pleasure. So um, you actually used the uh, Shadow Hills in your vocal chain, I think right? I'm going to enter the contest. <laughs> Get your I do. I have, I have one. Um, it's in my vocal chain. I, uh, I think it hits, uh, after the 1073, it hits my favorite 1176, and then it goes to that for just some extra kind of, you know, depending on what kind of song it is, sometimes we'll lean more heavily on that than the 1176. Oh, wow. cool. I love it. And I also use the, um, the mastering compressor on my uh, mix bus every day. Wow. I can't find anything to, to beat that. I just am cool. in yeah, love with it. That thing's huge, too. There's nothing like big knobs. <laughs> hey, you, you, you're going to have to carry the weight of that one, bro. <laughs> I was actually intimidated by the way that it looked because it looked so yeah, George it's Lucas. Just massive you know, knobs on it. It was so like, I'm the navigator in a World War II. Uh, <laughs> and, and I thought, I ignorantly thought, if something looks that kind of ominous it can't sound because it, it can't sound as good as it looks but i was very wrong about mm. that it mm. uh, sounds it actually sounds better than it looks and you said a while back um in fact i'm gonna read the quote so i won't butcher it the longer you work on a piece of music the less chance you have of listening the way someone will hear it for the first time that's genius so when i read that i quit the mix i was working on after 45 minutes but um can you expound on that? Because that's so true, man. I mean, it's like, and, and then you get painted in the corners. Like last week, Dave Way said you should take breaks, you know, every hour, every 45 minutes. But this is a, this is a different way of saying the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think that, I think that, um, you know, Stanley Kubrick, I often make a lot of movie analogies because I'm a fan of mm -hmm. uh, a lot of film directors. And he said that what's really golden when you're making a movie is not so much budget, it's time. Mm. It's time to step back and really look at it, look at the forest and question, like, do we have the right, is that the right line? Do we have the right lens on the camera? Are we in the right city? Are we, mm -hmm. do we need to shoot this exact same scene for the 500th time, which he would do stuff like that and drive everyone nuts. But, um, you know, I spent most of my 20s in a much more uh, humble version of the studio that I have now, uh, which is all just sort of a, exponential snowball of my very first Fostex four-track cassette oh, wow. machine, which I still have. Wow. That was my first real studio, that, and a Mac Plus, and a little Elisa's yeah. Microverb, and a couple of keyboards, and a drum machine that didn't sound very good. But I spent probably 10 years doing stuff. Um, I was a session musician throughout all of my 20s. Uh, for other record producers here in town. I moved here from Canada when I was 21. And so I had my home studio rig, and I would I'd work all through the weekends, and I would work 15-hour days, and I loved it, and I wanted to be doing nothing other than that. That's all I wanted to do my entire life. But the stuff I was doing in my studio, for the most part, wasn't really that great. It was fun for me, mm. and there were definitely moments of, well, that worked, mm. but then... You know, sometimes the song would be seven minutes long and it wouldn't bother me when I'd play it for somebody else. They were like, you know, maybe you could cut out that three minute bit. Why does verse two go on for three minutes? Right, that, that like song solo, form. Just I understand. Yeah, all What's of that. So says, I understand that. Yeah, it made sense to me at the time. Yeah, it still makes sense to me. But I noticed um, um, I became uh, a dad with my first child when I was 31. Mm -hmm. And I started working shorter hours then because I wanted to see my kid and so I started working kind of bankers hours like eight hour days and everyone around me was like what are you doing that's that's insane and I thought it was kind of insane too but I didn't know what else to do and it wound up being the best thing musically that I've ever done because it <clears throat> it's hard to quantify but 
I noticed that the results of whatever it was that I do or don't do, the results were getting better. Mm -hmm. There was more focus. It affected uh, your decision making process and very much so. In. Very mm -hmm. much so, mm -hmm. and and affected. The, the, the operative word here is objectivity. Mm -hmm. It affected my objectivity. I didn't have much before when I was constantly just like staring at the page. And you kind of <laughs> learn, you know, whatever the page says, you learn it that way. Yeah. Right. Whatever, you, whatever mix you got up, whatever song you're working on and trying to write, whatever pr stage of the process you're in. I can say process because I'm sitting with a Canadian. That's right, my man. Um, <laughs> but, you, you know, the more you listen to it, the more you learn it that way. How objective are you going to be after you've heard the same song ten times? And you can hear the same song ten times within the first hour of the working day. So by the time you're at hour six, yeah. how many times have you heard that song? If you make it to hour eleven, how many times have you heard that song? I don't mean. So I I say you know sort of uh, naively, but I mean it. Like I think one of the best things you can do when you're making a record is to get out of the studio. Mm -hmm. Go live a bit of a life. Go see a good movie. Go eat eat some food. Go hang out with the people you want to hang out with. Go to sleep. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a concept. Yeah, that's imagine true. that. Um, and and it, I I find that uh, it's always like the first two or three listens the following day mm -hmm. that are the most informative to me, and and kind of reveal yeah, everything. It's like yeah. oh oh right, of course I just need to do that or this mm -hmm. needs that or mm -hmm. I did get that right and I wasn't sure about that or I really got that wrong. And then and then the more I listen, the more uh, the less objective I am. So it's also too I find that that I'm less objective because once I, when I listen to something, uh, of course my job's a little different than yours, but when somebody brings me their, their, their song to mix, I hear the flaws and I hear what's good. Once I contribute to it, it turns great somehow. I don't know how that works, but I know it's my egos, and so, I, so that's why I rely so importantly on my first impression because, like I say, once I, once I start working on it, I fall in love with everything, including what I didn't do. Stuart Copeland called you the Swiss Army knife of uh, producers, <laughs> and uh, the reason I'm bringing that up now is because a, th a thread throughout your career seems to be uh, early on you 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 saw the importance of mastering all the elements of making a record, and and then it sounds like in your 20s you had a lot of time to hone that into a, a solid craft to the point now where you've had hits as a mixer. You're an, you're an incredible mixer. You've had hits as a writer. You've had hits as a producer. You've had hits doing various combination of all of those things. So, in terms of of all the things that got you to this place, I guess my question is: Can that be learned, or is that just innate? Is it a priori? Is it how how do you get to be you know Greg Wells? Like, can I be Greg Wells? I mean, is it too late for me? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you'd want to be Greg Wells, but um, I think you're doing just fine, yeah, by the way. Um, you know, there's, I, I can't remember where, but I read this quote once that I don't think I'm butchering. I think we're getting this right, that there's, there's great wonderment in not knowing what can't be done. Hmm. Oh, man, I love that. That's fabulous. Isn't that good? Yeah. So yeah. for me, growing up in Peterborough, Ontario, you know, my dad was a minister. I did not have an older sibling to turn me on to cool music, so all... I got was occasional snippets of like the Jackson Five on TV, and I was right. like, "What's that? I love that. What's that? Right. Come back on!" Mm -hmm. And you know, there was no VCRs, there was no kind yeah. of on-demand factor. I had to wait. Do they have electricity in Canada? We have parking meters as oh, well. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, we, Canada. We, no, we do all cuddle up in the same igloo. It's true. <laughs> so we, we were about to just jump across this table at you, and <laughs> double Canada. You <laughs> Actually, I love Canada. <laughs> Uh, Astero, I love Astero. Yeah, she's amazing. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's very easy for me to launch into this huge tangential thing right now, but I'll try and condense. Just, just you know, like I said before, just throw the optograph at me if I go on oh, too long. Yeah. But um, I never knew I could do this for a living. Yeah, like, me too. This did not exist. Everyone, you know, it was not modeled for me. I don't have any nepotism factor. I didn't know anybody in the business. I had, uh, you know, the only... When I moved to L.A. Uh, 20 years ago, I didn't know anybody here, and I was illegal. I, I was Canadian. I was just here to study with Claire Fisher, this amazing ah, composer. Claire and, Fisher. Uh, 
incredible story. So I would right? study with him once a week, and the rest of the time I just sat in my Van Nuys apartment and watched MTV and ordered Chinese food until I ran out of money and, and just scraped by, you know, doing demos under the table and yeah. eventually... Uh, about a year later, did become uh, legal. I was playing with Katie Lang, the great singer. I was in her Ooh, band for three wow. years. Ooh, and that got me up and running here in terms of actually being able to work. And then I was able to get my own visa. But um, You did Celine Dion pretty, reason pretty early on in that time period, too, didn't you? Was that right around then? No, that was uh, several years after uh, that. What? That was early on in my kind of uh, beginning of uh, my songwriting career. Oh. Mm. My songwriting career began with a real bang. Uh, and then kind of, you know, evened out. But, like, in, my first cut was with Aerosmith. Wow. And wow. then we, wow. then they wanted a, um, a big power ballad. And, uh, and so we submitted this song called The Reason, which was for Aerosmith. Wow. And uh, they passed on it. Um, and a couple years later, and we, we just played it for a lot of people. Joe Cocker, Rod Stewart, played it for tons of people. Mm. And I just thought... It's just never going to have a life. And then uh, a great publisher named Barbara Vanderlyn played it for Umberto Gatica uh -huh. mm -hmm. on a total whim. And when she told me she did that, I'm like, really? For Celine? She's like, yeah, why not? Anyway, Celine heard it and flipped out. And it was on the same record as the Titanic theme, so it oh. sold 31 million records. <laughs> and uh, nice. it was crazy. It was nuts. At least. Yeah, it was like... Um, more and then, Canadian, more Canadian contacts. Yeah, yeah, you know. But anyway, just sort of circling back to my kind of humble uh, beginnings at this, like it was really just, you know, any snippets of tiny little bits of pop culture I would get very excited by. Um, and so I would, we had a piano, and that was it. And I, I was obsessed with drums, but my parents wouldn't buy me drums because it was too loud, so I knew what every armchair, uh, armrest, every cushion, every pillow, every bit of the couch sounded like, mm -hmm. you know, the tone of it. And I would run around the living room at a very young age uh, drumming on that stuff. And, um, uh, and then eventually my mom thought she wanted to learn how to play classical guitar. So she bought a Yamaha student gut string guitar and was taking music lessons. And so I started noodling around on that just on the low E string I remember just like playing melodies on the one string mm. so I never knew A that it was not normal to play more than one instrument and also B I never even knew if I was good or not I had no clue mm. nothing mm. to compare it against I had nothing right. to compare it was me in a, in a bubble in a vacuum mm -hmm. and I, I to be fair with all due respect I don't think anybody else around me knew if I was good or bad or you know, they just, we just didn't know. Right. But, but you can't underestimate the power of frustration to help you move forward in terms of learning. And if you really want it, frustration seems like it was a, uh, a, a healthy catalyst because you turned it into a positive thing. It was a massive bit of rocket fuel for me, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I definitely... I... I don't mean this arrogantly, but I think I have been blessed with some degree of talent. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, that quote that like nothing is more common than uh, unrewarded genius or talented people that just haven't, it's a Calvin Coolidge quote, that persistence is omnipotent. Mm -hmm. I really, my desire to get into music, I think, was a bigger entity than whatever talent I do or don't have. Um, and I had this voracious really kind of almost dysfunctionally voracious appetite for even records I didn't like. I remember going to, <laughs> to Sam the Record Man in downtown Peterborough, it doesn't exist anymore, it's a big Canadian record chain, and like reading the liner notes of Sheena Easton records, which Absolutely. I wasn't even into, Absolutely. you know? Yep. And I wanted to know who was drumming, and, and I remember seeing some guys from Toto being interviewed on a Canadian TV show when I was about 14, and and the last question that they asked them was, you know, do you have any advice to people that might want to get into the music business? And they said, yeah, look at the records that you, that you like, look at, look at who's making them, look at where they're making them, and then go move there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Wow. And the last uh, part of this answer, which I'm only sharing this because I'm hopefully it will inspire somebody no, watching it's this. It's inspiring me. Another film director reference 
Akira Kurosawa, who we were talking about before mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, pr probably one of the greatest film directors yeah. ever to work in the in the medium. Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola and Spielberg and George Lucas all worship the guy um, and have remade a lot of his films. Yeah, Magnificent Seven is a remake of Seven Samurai. Yeah, yeah. I think even Star Wars is based on uh, some Kurosawa stuff. I might be wrong about that, but uh -huh. um, he wrote a really great book called Something Like an Autobiography. That's the title of it. And uh, he stopped telling his life story in the 1950s because he was worried about offending any of his friends if he made this story more current. He just, but he talked about his childhood and it was fascinating. He's a descendant from an old samurai family in Japan. Had this older brother who was this, you know, very influential figure in his life. And um, uh, the last chapter of the book is him being asked questions, uh, advice for younger filmmakers. And you can apply it to any kind of creative venture to, you know, to me it was music. Mm. And I think the question, <clears throat> the main question was, how do you become you? How do you become a master director? How do you become a Kira Kurosawa? And he said, in order to have a shot at be becoming a really good film director, I, I feel, a Kurosawa feels, that you have to master every element of making a movie. You have to know how to operate the boom mic. You have to know how to be a great actor. You have to know how to pick a lens for the camera. You have to know how to write the score for the movie. You have to know how to write a great script. You have to immerse yourself in the classics uh, of literature, of film. Soak it in. Get it in your bone marrow. Uh, drown in it, and then maybe you have a shot at, at, at being good at this, you know. In a similar way that an orchestra conductor usually knows how to play just about all the instruments. At some he knows how to play, he or she knows how to play very well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for better or for worse, that has been my kind of uh, naive approach at all of this, like really... H hence the Swiss Army knife. Um, I before. suppose so, yeah. It makes sense to me in hindsight. Going into it, it felt like I was walking backwards into all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, too, you, 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 some of those concepts are learned by going down dead-end streets, so to speak. They're not really dead-end streets. They're, they're ways of acquiring skills pertinent to the, the overall totality of the profession. Absolutely. I can't believe I said that sentence. Man, you should say it again. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> but I have medical excuses. Let me ask you this: when you when you create a record, and I, and I mean that in the most uh, romantic sense of the word, what percentage of the process is a function of your psychological skills? In other words, creating an environment for the artist to work in, etc. What percentage of it is your educational background, and what percentage of, percentage of that creation is just your God-given taste? That's an amazing question. Um, I, I will say that you know when I started uh, getting opportunities to produce records, I wasn't aware of how big the psychological role was mm -hmm, in huge. it. Uh, and on certain projects, it's almost all that. Yeah. And quite frankly. That's not why I got into doing this, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, to babysit uh, artists. To be a shrink. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like people would kill to be able to do what we all get to do for a living, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't mean this to come out the wrong way, but when I find myself in the studio, it's happened a couple times in my career with people that really just find the whole thing miserable and, like, they're, you know, it has to be painful and they're being disrespectful and... They kind of need that to be creative. I don't want any part of it. I'm, I'm not interested. I, I don't mind it being hard. It is a challenge. Making a great record is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. It's worth the, it's worth the chase. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know, I so uh, over the years I have learned to become a lot better with that. And it really it just comes from a place of empathy of realizing how terrifying it is for someone in, in this. I now I bring it up every time when I'm at the beginning of a record. The first two weeks of a record, are it's just it's like having an enema in front of everybody, you know, <laughs> and it, and people you don't know. There's an image like, I could use. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm done with that. <laughs> I apologize, but you know, it's just terror because they're looking at the producer, whoever they've hired, thinking, 
is this person going to screw my record up if I made the wrong decision? It's not until you get two or three songs kind of done, you play for some people you trust, and hopefully the feedback is good, and then everyone breathes this collective, Ooh, massive yeah. sigh of relief, and then you can kind of, you can get the fear out of the room, which is no small feat right. yeah. in making a record, and then hopefully, you know, create. And uh, uh, Quincy Jones has a great quote, um, you know, even if you do or don't believe in God, it doesn't really matter because you, you get what this means. It's like, leave enough space for God to walk into the room. I, I have sat at his house where he literally said that. It's such and a I've great quote. And I've repeated it for 15 years. It's so true. He it's said amazing. He, he said he would never record at home because you go to the studio and you leave room and God will come in the studio and magic happens there. Keep it out wow. of your house. And That's incredible. Did you hear that, Drew? Mm -hmm. That's so cool. So, not changing the subject and, and allowing you uh, the opportunity to expand on what you're saying. How possible is it for someone to give you something that's not a good song and leave with a great song? The production process is it designed in your mind to make to make everything about the uh, initial writing of that song better? And can it? Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. It's really. Um, you know, again, another movie analogy, I feel like the stronger, like if you have a really genius script, I think regardless of budget, you're gonna make a good, really good movie. If you have a gargantuan budget and the world's biggest actors, but the script is flawed, you can't make a great movie. So it really is down to the script, how tightly, how convincing. This is all storytelling, everything we do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all kind of storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the story is kind of, what? I don't get it, or the story really doesn't make sense. You have to, you know, I learned as a session musician working for various producers. Um, I bet that was an incredible learning opportunity. It really was, it was great. Um, and I, you know, I never, even at that point, didn't realize that I could ever become a record producer, but I, would, I was taking mental notes of like, mm -hmm. oh, that really worked, or boy, I, if I were that person, I wouldn't have made that decision, or, um, and, and inevitably, Whenever the session kind of ground to a halt and, you know, I was part of a live band or, or whatever was going on, if, if, if things were going great, it was always because the song is great. The song plays itself. Mm -hmm. You know, a really amazing song, as long as everyone's kind of paying attention and no one's, you know, driving drunk, the song will kind of record itself to a degree. And of course, you apply your own aesthetics and your chops to whatever you're doing. You, you make it as great as you can make it. But, um, you know, often people will get blamed if something's going wrong in a session, the producer will get blamed. The, we have the wrong drummer, we use the wrong mic, we're at the wrong studio, uh, should never have been done in this tempo. It's usually the song that is the issue. Mm -hmm. and, and very few people will go, you know what, we gotta... Mm -hmm. So sometimes there'll be like a, a great section of the song, like a great hook, a great chorus, or there are, there's a whole world of writers out there that write really amazing verses but are a little trigger shy when it comes to letting go and writing a great chorus. So I am at the point now where I can't produce a song unless I love it. And, and yes, I am sometimes a songwriter, but I never insist on also writing the stuff that I produce. I don't really, it doesn't matter to me. It's just as long as we get to the point where mm -hmm. I feel like the song is amazing. And if it's not, then we have to figure a way to, to repair it or not cut the song. One of the things that's consistent about all your productions in, <clears throat> in particular is they always sound modern, they always sound up to date without chasing any fads or, 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 or trends. It's like, it's like do, you make, nice thing to say. do you make a conscious effort to... It's like Quincy, we were talking about Quincy. It seems like everybody's down here trying to get the new kick drum, the new this, that, and the other, and Quincy just goes up here over our heads and just makes off the wall or, or something that, you know, it's like just makes you go, you look up and you go, oh man, I could have done that. Why was, why was I worrying about a kick drum sound? And, and your, your productions tend to do that for me. I, I can tell that they're, they're new and, and, and current, but yet they don't have, they're not, you don't, you don't achieve that with little cheap gimmicks and tricks like, the flavor of the month sounds and stuff necessarily. Is that something that, that you do consciously or just flows out of your... That's such a huge compliment. That's such, so nice to hear. I'm not aware of that, actually. I mean, maybe I am aware of it to a degree, because I don't... 
apologize didn't sound like anything on the radio, but yet it's it, but yet it it had traditional approaches and sounds. It was well, you know, it was your take on your modern take on 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 those things. I, I mean, wasn't that the most performed song of the universe in the last two hundred years or something? Ryan Tatter is a very. You should get him on the show. He's a very very. Ryan's very, a close very, friend of mine. I love Ryan. Sweet guy deserves everything that's happening to him and has busted his butt for years yeah. to make this happen and. You know, Apologize is a great song. I mean, how many songs open with the line, uh, I'm hanging on your rope, you got me 10 feet off the ground? <laughs> That's a lyric. That, what? I, what else is he going to say? What, mm -hmm. And then that chorus, it's too late to apologize, the melody and the way he sings it. Mm -hmm. um, but just the decisions you made, like, like, the, like the, the, the reverb, the, 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 the sound of when he sings the word apologize, I mean, there's no doubt that you're listening to emotion and energy and feel. I mean... Comping that vocal, I remember was I was getting chills, like like so, something's going on here. Um, uh, Where'd you record that vocal? In my studio. God, that must have been an incredible moment. Well, Ryan's like that. I mean, Ryan, Ryan, you know, most I produced the whole first One Republic record that had Stop and Stare on it, and oh, wow. a bunch of great songs. And he's just one of those singers. He's just such a well-oiled machine. He really just steps. What mic, mic did you use on that? We used a really great sounding Neumann 67 that I later sold to Ryan. He wanted the mic that he'd recorded the record on, and uh, I was into a 47 at that point. And I wish I'd never sold it, but it was it's a really... I got it from Dan Alexander. I traded him a, uh, a 57 Gold Top Les Paul for that 67, oh and it was it's really was a magic Is that legal? I know, it's all sound... <laughs> You're a guitar player. That's not legal. Well, I was... I, I wasn't using the guitar that much, and I thought, oh, I'm going to use that mic every day, so yeah, I'm going to, I'll go for it. And it was painful, but I'm glad I did it. And, and the mic, what mic did you, did you use? I've used the 1073 for years. Um, I, I went on a real, after that first Mika record, mm -hmm. um, which we made at the end of 2005 and into 2006, Joe Ciccarelli, I was lucky enough to have uh, Joe Ciccarelli. Joe's my guy. Joe is sick. He's, he's, he's just a nice human being, too. He's just the best. He's unbelievable. I've learned yeah. so much from him. I've asked Joe to be on the show. He'll be on the show, I think, soon. That'll be a great show. Yeah. He's heavy duty. So he has this 1073 in his rack. He has a few 1073s, but he has one that uh, the mic pre just sounds incredible and the EQ sounds incredible. It's magic. There's a difference in, in, the, in the different 1073s to you? Your hearing's that refined? Oh, they're definitely, yeah. If you, you know, you really notice the stuff when you A, B, when you plug into one mm -hmm. of them, plug into the next, and you, you can, and you, I think yeah. almost anyone can hear the difference. Yeah, components age and change. And sometimes and so, they get better and sometimes they don't, yeah. you know. So Joe and I, for about, off and on, for most of that Mika record, we're trying to find me a good 1073. I wanted one that sounded as good as his. And uh, I found one that the mic pre sounded as good as his, but the EQ didn't, but I didn't care. I just, I loved the saturation. The... Anyway, 1073 is the answer. Well, BAE I... makes some really good, uh, have you tried some of their stuff? That's what I have. Oh, you have a BAE? That's the one. Oh, that, the our one, boy Mark. Won yeah. the shootout. I yeah. can't remember. Uh, I'm telling you, we had, we had Mark on the show early on in the, in the course of the show, and, and I was amazed by, by his products. He goes through so much, so much, trouble and effort. Remember her? We were talking about that the other day. Good guy. Good guy. Uh, Quick question for you. Yeah. Can we work into uh, into your questions, some corner office questions? Some you know, I hogged about. the whole show. You didn't even get to ask any questions. No, 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 it's sorry. fine. Listen, I'm sure it's me. I'm all caffeinated. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. No. We just, we, just uh, we got some people who want to get people, some stuff in. People got questions. And by the way, as they ask those questions, we're going to earmark a couple of the probably the first two or three and make sure uh, yeah. told you to grab bag of shows we're going to get your vintage king t-shirt will Yay. pay to me so drew's you see drew's got his uh point at him drew just give him a point we can go Check uh, that, that, out. Was a, that was a weak point. <laughs> I'm <laughs> advertising point. right now plugging he, he didn't rehearse in front of the mirror today right, get some questions in drew <laughs> okay uh, hey greg um got a question a lot of people are concerned about producers block writers block i'm just going to dumb it down with that uh, how do you how do you deal with uh, producer's block, something like writer's block, which it just blocks the brain and you can't think about the song anymore? Great question. How do you deal with that? Do you mean if I've heard it too much or if, I'm, if I don't know what to do with it, or both? I guess both. Um, well, you know, it's like whatever, 
whatever, back to objectivity, like whatever tricks I can do to kind of get fresh with something again. Usually, this is a great story. I, got, I have to tell you this, and this, this sure. will answer a lot of questions. And oh. I was lucky enough to produce a record with Burt Bacharach early this year, mm. who I'm a huge fan of, you know, mm -hmm. forget about it. Burt Bacharach's like working with Cole Porter or something, mm -hmm. or Gershwin, yeah. you know? He's that good. He's yeah, I met him once, he's deceptively hip. He's, yeah, he's, he's deceptively everything, actually. Yeah. He's, just, he's really something else. They broke yeah. the mold. Genius musician mm -hmm. and writer. So, so I'm having my first meeting with him. I met his beautiful house, and, and we're sitting in his music room, and there's Burt Bacharach, and, you know, I'm having a massive Wayne's World, I'm not worthy, <laughs> <laughs> internal moment. Another and I'm sure Canadian was, reference there. Yeah, I'm sure it was more external than internal, but... So we're kind of 40 minutes into the meeting, we're talking about the project, and I'm, I'm like trying to, you know, be, keep it together and be professional. And, and I think I was doing pretty well. And then at one point, I'm just like, please forgive me. I have to launch into a sycophantic fan moment. And, mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's a guy who none of his stuff sounds the same. Well, that's true, isn't it? Like, say a little prayer to Raindrops, yeah. keep falling my head to Alfie, to you name it. San Jose. Yeah. Like, the, 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 I mean, the. Uh, thread of continuity is musicality and surprise, mm -hmm. but other than that, it doesn't necessarily sound like the same person wrote all of those songs. And, and you know, usually, as you were kind of alluding to earlier, people will usually find a device or two. Usually, it is just a singular device that works for them that does lead to a short shelf life. But you can get a lot of, you know, Fourth of July fireworks. That's important sentence. The, the, the devices shorten your career. That's a yeah. It's sense. like if you got the one trick, that's great. But it will people. It's just human nature, regardless of how brilliant a trick that is, or not a trick, but a thing. Technique. You know, it's like the one pitch that you got. People will eventually become tired of it. It might take ten years. It might take one year. Anyway, so I was fascinated with how fresh his stuff was and how and still how I could tell he was approaching stuff so I said when you're writing Bert mm -hmm. uh, what's your approach how do you how do you remain and he said oh it, he, you know he talks very like oh it's it's really simple um, when I'm I'm not gonna imitate him when I'm writing I'll work on, a, on an idea for a minute or two then I'll just put it away I said what a minute or two he said yeah one or two minutes, and then I'll just set it aside. And he said, if I work on it any longer than that, uh, it won't be fresh anymore. He said, it'll still sound good, it'll still sound musical, but I'll start applying all my shapes to it, my chord shapes as a piano player. He's a really good piano player. He's like, I, I have to get away from it, really. And I'll, but three hours later, I'll come back to it and revisit it. And then he said, um, as an orchestrator, because he produced, I think, he produced a lot of those hits that he had in the 60s and 70s, and he was doing, he was doing the orchestrations, all those great string and French horn parts and the trumpet thing, that sound, it's all him. And he said he would never arrange sitting at the piano. And he's a piano player. He would always do it just hearing it in his head and try and write it down for that same thing of trying to like just keep the ingredients as fresh as possible, like a chef, you know, picking out of the garden. and. We, we, we won't do it now because we've got to get to another question from Drew, but I have some fascinating stories of, I, work, I have the pleasure of working with Maurice White, and he's told me fascinating stories about things that inspired him to finish songs, and it would be the most, one, one of his biggest hits was inspired by a riot, he was stuck in a hotel room, was looking out over it, another one was, uh, he finished a big hit song of theirs by uh, going to the movie Close Encounters. Uh -huh. And he was just stuck for six months. He said he came out of the movie and it just poured out. But, you know, just moments where you think they're slaving away doing something musical, and it's not. It's something else. There's some external stimuli that just completes the picture. It's, it's fascinating that people understand to let themselves have that. You know, that's a, that's a gift of maturity, too, to say, no, let me not go to my devices. Let me, yeah. let me stay open to, Maurice calls it the universe. Let them, the yeah, universe I think it's, it's healthy. It's productive to recognize when something's not working. Yeah. No is, is not necessarily a negative word. Right. It can really be helpful. Drew, right. yeah. tell uh, us who asked this question man, and ask us a question. Oh, yeah, that was from uh, City. And the next one is from Gal Tesler. Question for Greg. What's your philosophy when writing melodies for the top line? Any concepts for traditional music theory that you recommend utilizing for this purpose? Interesting. I have studied 
a lot of traditional music theory. Um, and, you know, that, that um, phrase that it's, it's, it's good to know the rules so that then you can successfully mm -hmm. break them, mm -hmm. but you really do need to know them first, mm -hmm. I think is important. Um, I think that my choices for melody, <clears throat> frankly, everything musical, are definitely informed by the studying of, you know, I used to analyze Bach fugues at, when I was 14 and like, and see how Bach would write a melody and then flip it upside down and have that harmonized with his original thing and then make it go backwards and then backwards and upside down and make it all work yeah. and they're all playing at the same time. And um, so I'm not writing Bach fugues when I go to work, but there's definitely sort of an architectural knowledge of things that really worked in the past. And, you know, like, uh, was it Duke Ellington or Louis Armstrong that said, there's, there's good music, then there's the other stuff? It doesn't matter. <laughs> that was, I don't care that it was written 300 years ago or 100 years ago That's or true. yesterday. Uh, it's just good. So I, I think you have to get music. Here's where I'm going with this. You have to get musical knowledge to the point and studio, gear knowledge, all this stuff, you have to get it to the point where we're, what we're doing right now with language, none of us are really thinking about what we're about to say, mm -hmm. but we all know how to use this language. Well, that's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, basically, we're improvising. Mm -hmm. we, there's a bit of structure, mm -hmm. which... But, but it's a big ad-lib. Yeah, it's an ad-lib. We're improvising, and Oscar Peterson said composition is the same as improvisation, just slowed down. It's like it all comes from... <laughs> that place that so another um, yeah another amazing uh, amazing Canadian He's a hero of mine so um, I think I'm answering the question Drew I'm yeah, trying no, to it that's a great it's, answer uh, you have to forget what you know but I think it's really important to do your homework and what, that doesn't mean go study classical music necessarily you can do your homework just by listening to the radio you know listen up your arm pal mm. Baseball time. You ready? Yeah. Get your foot on the bag. Do I need a catcher? <laughs> need some rosin. You got it. I'm ready. All right. Enough metaphors. Let's go. Well, let's uh, I roll can't the help graphic. Myself. <laughs> Toss out the first pitch, David. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I want to give you some stream of consciousness stuff. This, this should be instruments and brands, whatever you want to give me. Sure. Acoustic guitar. I love uh, D35. Oh, Martin D35. Uh, also hummingbirds too. Love them. Gibson? Yeah. Uh, drum kit? I have a lot of them. Uh, it's hard to pick a favorite one. I do love the old Gretsch and Ludwig. Um, my current drum kit is a 1940s Slingerland Radio King with a 26 inch kick. And oh, that's huge. That, and I use that on everything now. It just sounds wow. great. Wow. Uh, piano? Uh, Bosendorfer. And I don't know how to say it properly. Is it bo bo Bosendorfer? Bo I just say Bosendorfer. I can't afford one, but that's my favorite piano. Wow. Uh, electric bass. I love a great P bass. You know, uh, there's a bass player here in Los Angeles named Dan Rothschild, one of my favorite bass players, yeah. and he has this yeah. early 70s P bass that just is the way bass should sound. Mm. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of that. Electric guitar. The one you just sold. <laughs> no, I like the guitar. Really? I mean, one electric know, guitar. Okay. Well, no, just like when you think of when you think of uh, um, you know like a classic rock sound. And what, what guitar do you reach for? Uh, I have a great SG. Jay Bennett, the late Jay Bennett from uh, the original Wilco lineup, turned me on to the magic of SGs, and I, I love that guitar. Yeah, they have a brightness that you can't get out of a Les Paul. Yeah. Okay, uh, favorite vocal mic under a thousand dollars? I would say um, SM7 or um, you know all the U2 records have been cut on a 58. I've heard that. It's true. Oh, that's interesting. For years. Uh, uh, another, another. Somebody else mentioned the SM7. Uh, just uh, generic synth. You're, when you when you if you had to go to a session with one synth, what would you take? There's a, <clears throat> there's a brand new synth made by that French company, Arturia. Oh yeah, I'm not familiar with them. Those guys are just so down the rabbit hole in a brilliant way, and uh, it's called the Origin, and I just got one, and they, 
it's like every vintage synth in one wow. keyboard. It is nuts. Mm. And it's actually not that expensive. Uh, you know, for the, what you would pay for one vintage synth, you can have like ten. Oh, that's worth the price of admission. That just that piece of information. Okay, you sh I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you some island questions. Basically, what that means is, if you're stranded on an island, what what one plug-in compressor would you choose? The CLA 1176. Ooh, good choice. And same question, but with EQ. Oh boy, um, the uh, probably the soft tube tube tech stuff. Oh, okay. It's oh, yeah, really good. The compressor's good too. All their stuff is uh, kind of and, amazing. And, and this this answer any way you want. Plug in real whatever. Uh, if reverb, your go to reverb. Go to reverb is. Uh, can I give two answers? Is sure. it just the one? Okay. Sure. Well, it's, it's really just one though, isn't it? You can, you can say the master room, right? I do love the, I have a master room uh, stereo spring reverb that just sounds like magic. It sounds good on everything. It's like, it's incredible. You guys get on eBay fast, the price is going to go up. I paid 220 bucks for that thing. I actually wasn't even sure what I was buying. It was a sort of an impulse buy several years ago and it showed up and I could not believe how good it sounded and I've used it on so many records. Wow. That was it, a good batter's box, wasn't it? Absolutely. That absolutely. was a fast one. And a great guest. Oh, uh, thank you. Great, thanks. Thank Maria. you very much. Will you come back? Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm such a fan of the show. Oh, cool. oh man. I've watched almost every episode. I was telling you guys this before. It's, yeah. uh, it's like a... Uh, it's, it's, frankly, it's good to hear. You know, we, we still operate like, we're still so blessed that guys like you feel that way and our audience feels that way. So it's good to hear it. It's just confirmation because, yeah. you know, Dave and I will we'll, we'll talk to each other and go, is this happening? I think it is. Look at the comments, and each week, you know, we're constantly. It's definitely it's, happening. It's, There's it's, nothing like it. Oh, There's cool. nothing like it where people get together and share stuff like this. There's. Uh, well, it's, it's well, you've a, shared a lot today. Yeah, I, and I it's can't a credit you credit to you guys and and Dave as well, and 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 the team that really cares about this, and the audience really cares about it. So, and as a fellow Canadian, proud of you, man. Thank you cool. so much. Absolutely. Thank you. A couple quick things before we go, guys. We're running a little bit long, but that's okay. Uh, we have our avid Pro Tool Nine winner. From Milwaukee, it's JC Tracks. Yay, look up on the screen. There's some stuff about JC. Congratulations. Oh, I see it. Proud of you. And for all those guys that have hung with us all these weeks, thanks to uh, <laughs> Avid for doing that. And then uh, you want to get into the contest for this little puppy. Thanks to Shadow Hills and Vintage King for, for all the, the great opportunities we have. I'm going to make sure I'm holding this the right, right, right way up. So, you want to do that. Uh, September 29th is a giveaway. You know, if you go through the show and rewind, you'll see how to enter. You see the, you see the, there's the credit right there. Enter right there. So, um, that's going to be a good one. You got some weeks to get in there. Make sure you get in there. Other than that, David, um, why don't you wrap us up and uh, let's get out of here. David? Hmm? Man, listen, uh, Greg said something earlier today that I'm really proud of, and I want to share it with you guys. He, he said, man, we're, we're creating a really cool, unique community. And the word community uh, is, the, is the operative uh, word in that sentence. Uh, I'm real proud of you guys. You guys are looking out for the younger guys coming up. You guys are looking out for the guys with dumb questions. You guys are looking out, and you're not, you're not trying to espouse and show off your knowledge. You're really trying to help the other guys that come out and hang out with us on Facebook and the other places. And I, I appreciate that, I really do. Real quick or he's gonna kill me. Shout out to Rudy Rupshan, and I'll explain that next week. <laughs> okay, because he, I'll explain it next week. You interrupted me for Rudy? Uh, yeah. Rudy, you must be awfully important, my friend. Absolutely. You're going to be working on him in about a week. So. Yeah. Man, this is, this is just so cool, this piece of gear. There, there's something about knobs, and this has got great knobs. Wow. I'm serious. I'm not being funny. Drew, 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 let's meet I'm later. not being funny. Yeah, this know, is right? this, <laughs> Dave Greg is will nice. tell you, a good piece of gear has to have a tactile feel, and it has to feel important. It has to feel good. This gear, you just look at it, first of all, and you know it's going to sound good. Then you, then the feel of it is well, good. Well, the beauty of it, and I know we have to go, is that out of, this is the 34th show. And if you had 400? 34th. And out of all the guests that have sat at the table and the guests that we Skyped in, Really, out of all those people, an incredible array of professionals, 
only you have this efficient to knobs, and they all do the same work. So, so say goodbye so we can go, because we're running long. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I know how the batter's box guest feels when they and I trap them into not expanding on anything. All right, guys, I'm not going to go, hey, 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 where's my camera? I, um, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, philosophize anymore, but I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. This is our Jerry Springer moment. Uh, Greg blessed us with, with a lot of knowledge and information and from his heart experiences, and the, the quotes were incredible. Uh, look up some of that stuff. Don't, don't just accept it. Uh, look up Kurosawa. Look up Quincy Jones. Look up some of these things and uh, expand a little bit. Uh, all my assistants are successful, and they're partly successful because I feel creativity doesn't have a particular form. It's not different creativity for music as it is for writing or painting or art or anything. So if, go to a museum. If you want to learn how to be a better mixer, go to a museum. See what the great painters are doing and incorporate all of that into what you're doing musically. It, creativity is creativity. See you next week. Amen.